generally disgusted by the growing mass hysteria and emotionalism encouraged by callous political leaders, he was absolutely horrified by the violence that started erupting. Terrorism had raised its ugly head. Feeling an outcast in mainstream politics, Ravindranath decides to return to Bolpur. Our next trip to Shantiniketan, this time by car. We just had to catch the monsoon, said to be the poet's favorite season. Through the car windows, the rain looked truly poetic. But at one point, the convoy had to stop. The road ahead was completely flooded, risky to cross. The mud, the slush, it was too much for us, the city bred people to take. Finally, we were directed to take a longer route. And now, the snow poetry left in the rain. All we saw were vast lakes on either side, drowning the paddy fields and village huts and left the people homeless. I guess one has to experience this dismal reality, the real India, before entering the land of his poetry. The notoriously truant schoolboy Rovindranath starts his dream school, Bolpur Brahmachodjo Vidyalaya an open-air school in keeping with ancient Vedic ashram traditions against the British model forced on India to provide a pool of obedient clerks. This, perhaps, is the first time he sets up a household of his own with his wife Mrinalini and their four children. Rabindranath's bonding with his wife was deep and sincere, invisible to the public eye. She gave him ample space to create his own world and she remained in the background as his unglamorous wife. A balancing effect on his quicksilver personality. But the city calls him back again in 1905. In protest against the proposed partition of Bengal along communal lines, we see him plunge into social action. October 15, 1905. The women of Jurashako stitch stacks of rakhis all night long. Next morning finds a barefoot Rabindranath out on the streets with families and friends to tie friendship bands on each other. The 
poetize rakhis even in muslims as a symbol of brotherly love Rovindranath wrote almost two dozen patriotic songs at this time. The impact of such occasional songs is usually short-lived, but our poet has infused them with such eternal appeal that they continue to inspire generations of Bengalis even today. of the new century sees death stalking him stealthily relentlessly Mrinalini his companion for 19 years dies in November 1902 Renuka his second daughter dies 9 months later His father and guru Maharshi Devendranath dies in January 1905. In 1907, 23rd November, on the 5th death anniversary of his wife, his youngest son Shomendranath, a lovely boy of 11, dies of cholera. He remembers Shomi's death 25 years later as the most poignant sorrow of his life. Sitting alone in the dark in an adjoining room, he prayed intently for his dying son to pass away into his next stage of existence in perfect peace. My mind seemed to float in a sky where there was neither darkness nor light. but a profound depth of calm a boundless sea of consciousness without a ripple or murmur i felt like a father who had sent his son across the sea relieved to learn of his safe arrival In March 1912 a bout of illness took him back to Shilaidaho for a rest cure Mango blossoms were in bloom there spring was in the air he couldn't remain idle for long yet he didn't have the energy to write anything new so he started translating Gitanjali as a mental exercise to recapture through another language the feast of joy he had felt in days gone by the story of the passage of those scribbled notes through literary circles in england and europe is quite well known a year later on an early evening in november a telegram arrives at shantiniketan it has been redirected from jorashanko his calcutta address it was news of the nobel prize for literature carried all the way from sweden through the dusty village roads of bolpur leaving the local folk unmoved and its recipient too who seemed equally unperturbed he is said to have handed the telegram to a colleague in shantiniketan and said in a jest 
Here comes the money for your sewage system. He knew all too well how fleeting could be any joy, any fame. In May 1918, Madhuri Lota, his beloved firstborn, finally passed away. With the image of his father in deep meditation in mind, he mourned the loss of his favorite Bailey through engagement with a higher purpose. He felt the time was long overdue to prepare ground for the religion of man to be practiced as a way of life. Just as many of us find a larger family beyond blood relationships, Rabindranath has envisaged a family embracing all humanity. Nineteen eighteen, Vishwa Bharati was founded on the twenty-second of December. Though it was formally inaugurated in 1921, its motto, where the whole world meets in one nest, here he would gather the best minds from east and west, from all over India and from overseas. To him, Vishwa Bharati would represent the quintessential wisdom of India, nurtured and nourished. Through ages of give and take with the rest of the world, we see all kinds of things about Rabindranath. We find his English rather stilted, his poetry. Too airy fairy, his head too up in the clouds, that he never stepped out of his ivory tower for the cause of the common man. But that one single letter of protest was an act of courage unmatched to this day. Yes, we are talking about the massacre of innocents at Jallianwala Bagh. While the nationalists were busy negotiating for seats in the parliament, and even the firebrand politicians were scared to protest, one solitary voice disproved all those allegations against him. He resigned his knighthood like a torn, discarded garment. His ringing prose became more poignant than any poetry he ever composed. His English rose to the occasion in an exemplary style and cut the rulers quick. His compassion spilled out spontaneously for some distant countryman whose martyrdom was buried in hushed silence. Contrary to a wildly held.